Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest monthly movie night series. My name is Anna Volker, and I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight is all about the science of the Star Wars universe, and I am so excited to get started. We about have about 200 people signed up for tonight's event, so I'm looking forward to a lot of questions and a lot of great discussion. As you may have noticed, I just turned off the chat so that it doesn't interfere with our captions. Uh, I have a couple accessibility announcements, uh, including the fact that we do have live CART captioning available, as well as ASL interpreting. Uh, throughout the day, if you have, throughout the event, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature to type your question into the chat. You can also click the raise hand button and raise your hand to ask a question verbally. If you're one of our deaf attendees and would prefer to ask your question in sign language, you can do so by putting a message in the Q&A stating your need to ask a question in ASL, and we will be able to enable your video access. I'm really excited this, this month to be partnering with WestFest. WestFest 2020 is Ohio State's celebration of science, engineering, sustainability, and outreach. And this program is made possible through a great Grant from the Ohio State Energy Partners. So today we're not only representing the Ohio State Astronomy Department, but actually partnering with this West Set Fest event, which has a series of online events happening throughout the entire week. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to begin by announcing our wonderful panelists. I'll have each panelist say a few words about themselves, why they're here, what they work on, and their favorite Star Wars character. So to, to kick things off, we'll start with our resident expert on galaxies far, far away. And you can see from her, from her wonderful outfit that she is ready for the task. So to begin, Dr. Barbara Ryden from Ohio State's Astronomy Department. Yes, thank you, Anna. It's a great pleasure to be here. As Anna mentioned, I'm a professor in the Astronomy Department. And I do, in fact, study galaxies far, far away. <laughs> and as we'll probably be discussing further during this evening's event, when you look at a galaxy far, far away, you are of necessity seeing it as it was a long time ago. My favorite Star Wars character, that's varied over the years. However, during the pandemic, when I was growing up my pandemic care, I felt a very strong fellowship with Chewbacca the Wookiee. <laughs> so one of the questions we can ask is, what does a clean-shaven Wookiee look like? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Next up is Dr. Iman Chadhuri, who is an assistant professor from the Department of Material Science and Engineering, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and Department of Physics. So an expert in many subjects. Welcome, Dr. Chadhuri. Oh, and I believe you're on mute. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, my uh, passion is lasers and laser materials interaction uh, with high power lasers and high intensity lasers. So uh, this means working with things like femtosecond. So it's like a blink and you miss it. So uh, that means that if uh, a femtosecond pulse could be made to be one second long, we will all be older than the age of the universe. So it's kind of gives you the scale how short these lasers are in pulses. And so um, I built lasers and do lots of different types of experiments with them. So at Ohio State, I actually built uh, one of the most powerful lasers in operation in the world. It's called Scarlet Laser. And it's a Department of Energy supported user facility now uh, in Department of Physics. So that produces at an instant peak power uh, of 20 times the Earth's entire Earth's power grid peak power for 30 millionth billionth of a second. <laughs> so for a very short time, it produces enormous amount of power, but it is no match for the Death Star's laser <laughs> or whatever it is. It'll definitely be, uh, in, uh, yeah, really grilling you on that a little bit later. So I have a lot, a lot of laser questions lined up. And, did and you my, share? Yeah, my favorite character is R2-D2. Perfect. Well, that's a great transition to our next panelist, Andrew Wong, who is our robotics software engineer. Welcome, Andrew. 
Thanks, Anna. Um, so a little bit about myself. I went to school and I got a degree in robotics. And now I'm working as a software engineer and I write code that basically helps robots perceive their environment around them. Um, and my favorite Star Wars character has to be, I think, Kylo Ren, just because I really like his character arc. Awesome. Thank you so much. And last, we have Dr. David Martin, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at The Ohio State University's Astronomy Department. Welcome, Dr. Martin. Hi, thank you very much, Anna. I do come from a place far, far away. I come from Australia, hence the silly accent. <laughs> I work to find uh, circumbinary planets. So these are planets like shown here, where you actually have one planet around two stars, just like we see in Tatooine. I use missions such as the Kepler and TESS space telescopes to see the planet transiting, which simply means that you view the system edge on and you have to have this precise geometric alignment such that the planet passes in front of the stars and see a little dip in their light, a little shadow. Uh, as far as favorite planet, uh, well, as far as favorite characters go, I think there's only one choice here. It is indeed the person who led to the rise of the empire, that of course being Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> you know that he uh, led the Senate to overthrow the empire. <laughs> and of course, little, maybe not as well known, is that if you look very closely, he is actually mind controlling people. That is not him speaking on his own free will. This is purely controlled by Jar Jar. And so I'm very happy to take questions mainly on this important topic of how Jar Jar led to the overthrow of the empire. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. <laughs> I'm very impressed with your uh, video presentation there. <laughs> So uh, one quick question I see in the chat before we get started. Uh, if you're only seeing the interpreter, that happens if you're not in the Zoom app. So if you opened it in a web browser, you will actually lose the gallery view function, which allows you to see all of our wonderful panelists at the same time. So if anyone's having that issue, it's because you're not in the Zoom app. Um, so my recommendation is to switch to the app to make sure you can view everyone. Otherwise, you will only be able to see the interpreter who is spotlighted for our deaf and hard of hearing audience members. So with that, I have so many questions and it's hard to pick where to begin, but I'm going to start with you, uh, Dr. Martin, because you mentioned a very interesting concept, these circumbinary planets like Tatooine. So we know that Anakin and Luke Skywalker both lived on this planet with two suns. And so I'd really like to hear a little bit more about your research trying to find planets like Tatooine in real life. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Certainly. So... Of, I mean, two things are common in the universe. So our star is a singular star in the solar system, but actually binary stars or even triple stars are actually very, very common. Roughly half the stars in the galaxy that we know exist in multiples, like Tatooine, as you can see here. Also, sometimes when you get two pairs, two stars in a pair, you get them of different sizes. So we can see here, we've got one sort of yellowish star and one sort of reddish star. And so this actually indicates that you have a bigger star and a smaller star. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find planets around these two stars. Now you think, okay, well, if binaries are super common, then shouldn't planets around binaries be super common? Well, this might be true, but it's actually quite hard to find planets around binaries. Um, essentially, the presence of two stars kind of screws up your usual techniques that you would use around single stars. So I try to develop new techniques to find planets around two stars. And then also do a little bit of analysis. So once we find a planet around two stars, we can do some analysis. For example, here you can see all these equations here, which I'm sure it's very obvious to understand. If you take into account how big Luke Skywalker is, you can work out how big those stars are just by the parallax effect. And that's the type of research I work on. Amazing, thank you. And so as we know within Star Wars, it's just riddled with these habitable alien worlds. So my next question is how likely do you think it is that there are indeed so many planets where life can exist and have scientists found any good candidates for potentially finding life on these faraway planets? Great question. So what we have found, one of the other surprising things we've found is we found a, a deluge of planets that are not like what we see in the solar system. They're so-called super Earths. So you have Earth uh, this way, and then Neptune will be over here. And you get all these things in between the two. And these are actually very common in the universe. And so now we're thinking, okay, well, could you have life on these planets? Now, these planets are a little bit bigger than Earth. And we think that some of them might be rocky. But then you go to the next level of detail, there could be other challenges. For example, we think that the molten core of the Earth 
which is liquid, which rotates, giving us a magnetic field to protect us from the sun, maybe these guys actually would have a solid core and hence no magnetic fields. That would kind of screw you over. As for life, there might be other challenges. If you are only a little bit bigger than the earth, but a lot more massive, then you're going to have a lot stronger gravity. And so gravity is going to be pulling you to the ground. And so the idea that you would be standing upright, uh, just like us or like Jaja Binks, is perhaps not necessarily going to be the case. Perhaps life would be more sort of lower to the ground, more snake-like due to this heightened gravity. That's really fascinating. and actually leads into another question I had, which was how likely would it be that we'd have humanoid aliens because whether it's because it's easier to put makeup on a person than make a cgi character a lot of what we see in star wars are you know bipedal humanoid alien characters so how likely do you think it would be that this you know alien life would look like us great question i i think that of course we're always limited by our experiences but i guess also our imagination if you look on the earth most life is not bipedal most life on the earth is has four legs or many legs or something um of course buying bipedal has some evolutionary benefits it means we can look a lot higher to look at predators outside of the grass etc but i think a lot would come down to the gravity and if you had a heightened gravity being bipedal would be would be tough it would be tough on your bones and you probably wouldn't necessarily evolve that way and other things would also evolve differently like our eyes for example we see a tiny amount of the electromagnetic spectrum. It was mentioned before, lasers of very different frequencies and stuff. There are all kinds of frequencies of light out there, but we only see a tiny fraction. And so probably other aliens would see different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Interesting, thank you. And one final question for you before I move on to um, another topic here would be, if you could tell us a little bit more about what signs for life would look like if we found them. So, you know, we are looking at these exoplanets, planets around other stars that are so far away. How, what, what are we actually looking for when we say searching for life? Sure. So there are, right now when we search for life, we are basically searching for molecules and elements in the atmosphere of a planet, which we believe could only have come there through life. So, for example, oxygen in our atmosphere coming from photosynthesis, we believe that we believe that we have a fairly good understanding of what non-life mechanisms produce certain elements, and then the leftover we would think would be caused by life. And we saw this recently with the discovery of phosphine on Venus. We basically looked at all the things we think can produce phosphine, and we don't think they would work, and so therefore it could be life. Of course, there could be some big caveats about that. So for exoplanets, we're looking at the atmospheres. Now, how we do that is you try to get this chance alignment where you have the star and the planet in front of it with respect to you. And you see the star passing through the atmosphere of the planet, but some wavelengths of light will not pass through the atmosphere of the planet. They'll get absorbed by certain elements. And so by seeing what light does and does not pass through the atmosphere, we can see what elements are and are not in the atmosphere. And then maybe they might be indicative of some cats like Barbara's. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Speaking of, of Barbara and her, oh my gosh, wow, there's just cats left and right. I'm so excited about all of these guest panelists joining us for our Star Wars discussion. <laughs> so Barbara and Barbara's cat, uh, I'd like to turn things over to you. Uh, so as a cosmologist and an astrophysicist, uh, I'm just wondering if you can give us some background on just how big we're talking about when we're talking about these distances traveled in Star Wars, because we see people traveling these incredible lengths. And so I'm hoping you can put that in perspective for us by telling us roughly how large is a typical galaxy? Well, that's a very appropriate question. First, however, I have to address the um, cat in the room. The cat is named Mrs. Chippy. <laughs> for those of you who are interested. Now I can go on to talk about space. <laughs> the problem with space, if you want to travel through it, is that there's too much of it. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, of course, tells us space is big, really big. So let's start stepping out through space, one step at a time. I'm sitting here with Mrs. Chippy in my home office in Columbus, Ohio. 
if I got bored with Columbus for some reason or other, um, the city of Dayton, Ohio is 100 kilometers, a little over 60 miles from where I'm sitting in my office. So I could drive there in about an hour tooling down the interstate. But you know, if Dayton just wasn't exciting enough for me, I could decide I want to go to Mars. Now the planet Mars, even at its closest approach to the Earth, is at a distance for me that's several hundred thousand times the distance to Dayton, a factor of nearly a million. And so when NASA sends a spacecraft to Mars, the time that elapses from launch here on Earth to arrival on Mars, is typically about eight or nine months. So if you wanted a realistic film about a trip to Mars, you'd have to do a lot of cutting. <laughs> Think of it, you know, eight or nine months, it's a lot of tedium getting to Mars. However, if I wanted to go from the solar system to the sun's nearest neighbor among the stars, Proxima Centauri it's called, it's called Proxima because of its proximity to us. As stars go, it's really, really close. However, the distance from here in Columbus, Ohio to Proxima Centauri is several hundred thousand times the distance from here to Mars. So again, it's a factor multiplying by almost a million. So interstellar travel, even if you've mastered interplanetary travel within the solar system, is very difficult. But even if Proxima Centauri wasn't exciting enough for me. If I wanted to go to the nearest galaxy, the nearest large galaxy comparable in size to our own Milky Way galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. And the distance from here in Columbus, Ohio to the Andromeda galaxy is, again, several hundred thousand times the distance from here to Proxima Centauri, the nearest star. So every step outward, traveling between planets within a galaxy, traveling between stars in a galaxy, and traveling from one galaxy to another, you have an increase in length of nearly a million. So, yeah, really, really difficult. To put it in terms of the travel time of light, the fastest thing there is, from here to Mars, at closest approach, it takes a few minutes for light to get to Mars. To get to Proxima Centauri, light takes four and a quarter years. And to get to the Andromeda galaxy, even light, the fastest thing there is in the universe, takes two and a half million years. Wow. So intergalactic travel, if you did it realistically, you'd have a movie two and a half million years long, a real <laughs> bore. So, Science fiction movies usually use some sort of buzzword like warp drive or hyperspace to signify, oh, we're taking a shortcut. And I believe behind you, Anna, you have Luke and Chewie going into hyperspace. Carefully <laughs> unexplained in the movies, but it's a con very convenient plot device to get between two points that are very widely separated in ordinary space. And that's the very next thing I wanted to talk to you about is this concept of faster than light speed travel. I think that's gonna be one of the questions our audience wants to hear about. Is that something you think could ever be a possibility or is it simply with, without question, something that we will never attain? Um, well, the question I, well, let's say, just say, as far as technology is concerned, not gonna happen. But let's put on our physicist hats and say, is it permitted by the laws of physics? Now, the uh, laws of special relativity say you can't travel through space faster than the speed of light, but general relativity, Einstein's develop, the more advanced development of special relativity says, you can do anything you want to space at any speed you want. You can bend or warp space. So this is kind of the concept behind warp drive. Right. For instance, excuse me, I'm going to put the cat down on the floor now <laughs> because I need a prop. Here I have a nice long ribbon. So it's about four feet long. Suppose an ant were at one end of this ribbon 
and wanted to travel to the other end of the ribbon. If it has to go along the ribbon, it can only travel at the speed of ant. And let's face it, even the Usain Bolts of ants can't travel all that rapidly. <laughs> so the ant might say, oh, it's too far, it's gonna take too long. But suppose I could take the ribbon and fold it back on itself. Then by bending the ribbon through another dimension of space, I can bring the two ends very close to each other. And so that's kind of the, the ribbon explanation of warping or bending space to take two points that are widely separated in ordinary space and then bending space back on itself so that you can just bink, hop over, taking a shortcut as it were. Right. So when we're talking about that shortcut, when they show it in the films, you get something like my Zoom background where you have the light from the stars stretch back. And my question is, if we just pretended for a second that you really could go that fast, is this actually what it would look like? Would you actually see this phenomenon? And if so, why is that? Um, well, my answer is, who cares? It just looks so cool. <laughs> But uh, as Dr. Martin was saying, there are so many different wavelengths of light out there and our eyes can only detect a few of them. What our eyes would see probably wouldn't look as cool as what uh, Luke and, and Chewie are looking at behind you. So um, you would have to ask a, a real specialist in you know, what it looks like when you go into warp drive. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, well, we're gonna switch to another topic here. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryden. And just a reminder for our audience, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and in a, shortly we'll switch to all audience questions. So as you think of them, for any of our panelists, feel free to add them and we'll do our best to get to all of your questions. So next up, let's talk lasers. So Dr. Chowdhury, uh, as you mentioned, lasers are your specialty and they're a big part of the Star Wars universe. So before we begin the laser talk, I'm wondering if you could just give us a little bit of background on what actually is a laser and how does it work? Oh, and you're, you're muted currently. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, very special occasion. Uh, can you hear me clearly all? Yes, perfectly. Okay, cool. So uh, in the background, as you see a uh, Kuiper crystal interacting with uh, mid-infrared laser. No, just kidding. It's zinc selenide crystal uh, and interacting with invisible light. Uh, but the light as it's going through the crystal, you see it's producing lots and lots of red light by something called a nonlinear high harmonic generation process. But, but anyway, the, 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 the entire idea of laser is that uh, it's a, you could call it a quantum leap in human beings' discovery of things. Like, uh, like you can call it, uh, you know, like we say, before Christ, after Christ, and so on, and a time separation, right? We call it before wheel, after wheel, like before the discovery of wheel, after the discovery of wheel, or before the discovery of fire, after the discovery of fire. So a laser light is something that is very unique. Uh, without quantum mechanics, you could not explain explain it. So in general, the way it works is uh, it needs very few components. Just look at two hands. Sorry, I don't have awesome props like uh, Dr. Martin did, but uh, two hands as two mirrors. And then in the middle of two mirrors, uh, imagine my cell phone in the middle of two mirrors as uh, a um, uh, some sort of crystal, kyber crystal, some gain medium. And then you have to send energy into this crystal. Uh, actually, yeah, I, I don't know if I, nah, I, I think sharing screen and all of that, I, I do have a movie made, but uh, uh, basically which, which demonstrates this. But the, the idea is this, that this uh, material inside is a, is a quantum material. And by that, I mean every material is a quantum material. So what happens is imagine it's got, say, three floors in it. So ground floor is always where the electrons occupy. Electrons are the one that changes the material energy state, et cetera. So you pump some energy, electrons go to the third floor. And immediately they cannot, they always want to stay on the ground floor. So what happens is that by choice of this fancy kyber crystal, you put it up here on the third floor, immediately they cannot come down back to the uh, ground floor. They go to the second floor. 
and they get stuck there. So the other interesting thing is that when electrons go from one floor to another floor, if it goes to a higher floor, you have to give it energy. If it comes down one floor, it, have to, it has to uh, give away that energy. A lot of the time it gives away the energy in light. And uh, basically what you do is that then when it goes from third floor to the second floor and gets stuck, now you have a lot of electrons stuck in the second floor. They want to come down. So they come down, you know, one by one. And then sometimes they, uh, they emit light uh, where that uh, they can just go straight into one mirror and then get reflected back to the cell phone inside the kyber crystal. And what happens then is that from one to two, and then when it bounces back to the other hand and goes back two to four, four to eight, and then very soon you get millions and millions of photons. And then one of these mirrors are intentionally made bad. So say it only reflects 90 out of the 100 photons. So the 10 that comes out, that is the laser. So the, the, the beauty of the laser photons is that they're so-called coherent. So that means that all the lights in the photon, uh, they are, they're kind of swimming in sync, like a, synchronous, uh, like a synchronized swimming. Uh, whereas in ordinary light, what you see, they're all out of sync. They're, they're being emitted in uh, sort of uh, when, uh, you know, electromagnetic, uh, uh, light is electromagnetic wave. So these disturbances, if they're perfectly synced, that's what a laser does. And if they're not synced, that's ordinary, uh, 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 ordinary light. Uh, so that's um, uh, kind of a very short uh, description of a laser. I hope uh, that helps. Uh. That definitely does. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it wouldn't be a Star Wars panel if we didn't talk about lightsabers. So I'm glad you're here to help us out with this. Uh, I think the main thing our audience is going to want to know is, could these be real? Could you, laser, a laser expert, ever design a real lightsaber? Uh, and if not, why not? I see. So uh, short answer is with the laser, it's very hard to do a lightsaber. So right now you have some of these cutting and drilling lasers that uh, people do uh, lots of tool making instead of a lathe or a mill uh, uh, that traditionally people use to you know, make metal parts and whatnot. But these lasers are very powerful, kilowatt class, or they produce 10 kilowatt. They, you know, if you, you can really damage and burn and cut steel and so on, or, or your hand if you prefer, like, a, you know, in the, in, uh, in the duel between uh, Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, right? But, but it's going to take enormous amount of time. You have to hold your hand like this for a long time. It's not so easy, right? So um, the short answer is uh, since you cannot confine light, uh, you cannot make a lightsaber with a laser uh, any way that I can know of. However, there are cleverer ways to go around it. With lasers, especially with intense lasers that you see, you see with, with lasers that is mid-infrared, so we cannot see it at all with, with naked eye but you excite other material and then you can create this plasma spark there inside a material. So this will not happen in vacuum, but say in Earth's atmosphere, you make a very powerful laser that then can self collapse. So what happens is a laser that it's traveling, when it goes through say air, it can change and start to use the air as a lens to try to focus itself. And if you can uh, adjust it perfectly, this coming in of the laser as going out, it can create a long filament of plasma. Mm -hmm. And now if that plasma, plasma is just ionized gas, the gas that is electrons and pro, uh, ions are all separated now, but it, you can confine it with a magnetic field, like a coil of magnetic field. So if you could cleverly do something like that, it would look like a lightsaber perhaps, but it'll be still very hard to cut it because the amount of energy needed to cut something is, is, is really difficult. So the closest thing I can think of without a laser is that a plasma torch or a, or a welding uh, device or something like that. So you could make cool lights and, uh, uh, you know, device, uh, sorry, uh, make the thing with some kind of uh, jet of gas that will, you know, uh, 
kind of be able to look like a lightsaber and do some damage. But still, um, it's going to be very hard, like, how they can stop each other. Like two lightsabers, they cannot cross. <laughs> this, this will not happen. You'll just go through each other because uh, plasmas cannot stop each other. So it's really mess up the fight choreography for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so lightsaber is going to be the toughest thing. The, the other things are possibly, uh, you know, easier. Um, so fire away. Any other question you have? Yeah, I was going to say, let's talk about some of, some of those other laser Star Wars applications. I, I do see a, a few questions here. Um, first off, a few folks have actually asked if you could send us the link to that video. If you want to just send it in a, a message to me, if you have it, I can, I can share it with the attendees. A few folks are, are interested in watching. Oh, the, the, the video of the kind of laser demonstration? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I have a class lecture that explains some of this. I don't know if that's a good idea to put up. Uh, I can share with you then. then you can... Yeah, you can share it with me. It doesn't have to be right now because everyone who signed up, I have your email. So it cool. can even be after I can send it out to folks. Um, but a couple of folks have, have requested to, to see that. Uh, and cool. another question I'm seeing here is about that Death Star application. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, a laser that destroys planets. How how realistic is that concept? And if it could ever work in theory, what kind of power would you need uh, supplying something like the Death Star to be such a powerful laser? Okay, well, first of all, a very short detour. It seems like in Star Wars, lasers are death machines, okay? <laughs> right. and, and uh, you know, with, with my wonderful panelists where they're explaining things that are beautiful, abstract, and I'm like a death merchant, right? No, this is not true. Lasers save lives. I'll, I'll give you a very short example, oh, I promise, within a minute. Uh, just one minute it'll take. But basically, uh, when, you know, a uh, heart problem uh, in the U.S. and in the world is a very big problem. A lot of people die out of heart attack and related uh, uh, sicknesses, illnesses, right? So one of the coolest things that lasers do, especially ultrafast lasers do, the kind I'm, I'm showing uh, going through that crystal, uh, they can make these amazing stents out of uh, uh, metals uh, uh, called nitinol or compounds called nitinol or tantalum, uh, where you cut out of uh, this, uh, uh, basically a tube of metal that you cut lots of stuff out of it so that it, it, it is very springy. And then what you do is uh, a physician, a surgeon then inserts it into the artery. And then once you insert it into the artery, the way it's machined, it's called cold machining with ultrafast lasers. You can create this beautiful pattern without any damage to the other side. So like a regular thing, you, you cut something, it'll crack everywhere. So this one, these are finely machined. And actually there are places in Ohio that does it. I visited them. And those stents go inside you. And as soon as they go inside you, the material aspect of it makes sure by the temperature of the blood, it springs and keeps the artery open. So lasers do save lives. Now let's get back to the death machine, right? Yeah. So, so the, the, the Death Star, it's, uh, yeah, it's never going to happen. There are far easier way to kill planets. So I'm not sure if I should explain all the easier way to kill planets. Uh, we seem to be killing it just fine without <laughs> much ado, right? But, but basically, imagine the energy that is required to uh, you know, hold a planet. This is the first thing that came to my mind. It looks like you know, David Weinberg uh, shared something very similar. So, so typically, you can say that how much energy would it require for you to destroy a planet which is held together by gravitational energy? Basically everything in the universe, including us, have a gravitational energy holding us together. But it's not the gravitational energy that is holding us together. It's more like the uh, uh, ele electro, uh, electro uh, it's the electromagnetic force that's mainly holding us together. But, but anyway, um, but the gravity for large object is very important as electromagnetic forces for us. So for gravity holding it together, it requires, if you wanna get rid of the gravitational force to destroy a planet, it requires you to hire the sun. So call up the sun and say, hey sun, don't do anything. Supply 12 days of all the energy you produce to me inside Death Star. 
and then somehow I'll convert it to some awesome laser pulse and then send it and that'll destroy it, right? And even that is unrealistic because the problem is when you try to shoot something, a whole bunch of energy can be reflected back at you. <laughs> so <laughs> it could be small enough, but big enough for a size of Death Star to be completely destroyed by just the reflected energy from the planet, right. our planet's atmosphere. So, because as soon as that laser hits the planet's atmosphere, it's going to plasmify everything. And plasma, just like the metal in your mirror, is a perfect or near perfect reflector. So, the Death Star will kill itself. So, wow. <laughs> so, uh, it would be so much easier. It'd be yeah, so it's, so it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty cool in the movies, right? <laughs> so, so, problem, is, yeah, so it's a bigger problem. A far easier problem is to use something that wiped out. Uh, dinosaurs so you you just hurl a kinetic weapon uh like a, a you know big mete me meteor or something like that somehow you manage to hurl it uh, and then basically the destruction of that within the atmosphere will wipe out you know most significant life right. and uh, again uh, you know I, i'm in no way recommending it but lasers are going to be very poor choice uh the other problem with laser is that it's wall plug efficiency, although, you know, those things are, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that. Maybe there's other questions like, you know, laser weapons or something like that. So. Perfect. And we do have a few on that topic actually, but I think I'm going to transition to some robot questions. Um, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, so last up is Andrew Wong, our uh, robotic software engineer. And I'm very glad you're here because I think that robots are a huge part of the Star Wars universe. And some of our most iconic characters, you know, R2-D2, C-3PO, uh, are most beloved. Um, so my first question for you is about the advancement of these robots, how advanced they are. They seem to have this power of free will and free thinking. So how does this compare to current robotics technology? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I could just compare like the C-3PO robot, you know, in Star Wars to what we have available today. And I could kind of start from like a mechanical standpoint and then move on to like a software standpoint. From a mechanical standpoint, I can actually share my screen and then I actually prepared some slides um, for this. Let me see. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes, we can see it now. Cool. Um, so I have a slide that's titled Humanoid Robots, and on it I have three different kinds of uh, robots that are humanoid. On the left-hand side, uh, this would be a good example to compare to C-3PO. Um, it's a robot that is white and black, and it has uh, electrical wires going into its shoulders and also around its hips. Um, and this robot is actually manufactured by a company called Boston Dynamics, and it's called Atlas. Um, so in terms of bipedal robots like C-3PO, it is uh, two-legged robots, for example. I believe we're pretty close to that. And in terms of the control scheme and everything, we have a lot of uh, algorithms on that side handled. Um, but in the area of free will, for example, and like the software side of things, um, I think we're still pretty far away from that because we'll see C-3PO, you know, in the movies, he, he's cracking jokes. He's able to translate languages um, and basically make decisions as any human character would. And I think that's still pretty far from what we have today. Um, some of the most advanced things that we have today in terms of um, intelligence that's artificially created would be to, um, for instance, recognize objects with a camera. So you might have like an apple in front of a camera and in this scene you want to use your algorithms to identify what's in it. So you might label like an apple, a table, for example. And that's some of the most advanced tech that we have in terms of that. Um, and another field that uh, people are working a lot on uh, is the field of autonomous cars. And you can kind of think of an autonomous car as you know, a robot that's trying to imitate a human driver. And in the same way that C-3PO has to make these um, tough decisions and um, very intelligent decisions. A car has to figure out, you know, which lane do I take? What do I do if there's a pedestrian who's jaywalking, you know? Um, but in terms of like human-like intelligence, I think we're still probably decades away from that. Thank you. That's really good to know. That's really fascinating. And so another kind of follow-up I have for you is when you look at Star Wars, it seems like robots are everywhere and they're commonplace. You know, you see Luke family of farmers being able to afford R2-D2. So how close are we to the, a reality where robots are commonplace in our everyday lives? Yeah, that's also a really great question. Um, 
as you see in the Star Wars universe, um, robots are basically everywhere. Um, I think we're still a few years, maybe a few decades away from that um, reality as well. And it really depends on kind of like what the application of the robot is. So I have on my screen uh, several different examples of robots. In the middle, you'll have, uh, you'll see a vacuum cleaner robot called a Roomba manufactured by iRobot. And it consists of just like a circular robot that drives around the floor, sweeping up uh, any kind of mess that's on the floor. And uh, this kind of robot is actually already available for people to buy. It's a few hundred dollars. So you could actually buy one of these yourself if you wanted to. Um, in terms of other like household tasks, the way that C-3PO is portrayed in Star Wars is you could imagine him, you know, helping you out with your laundry. So if you gave him like a basket of uh, laundry, maybe he would run the machine. And then after that, uh, take the laundry, fold it up and put it in your dresser. And the ironic thing is this seemingly simple problem is something that's kind of a uh, kind of a joke in academia. If someone were to say, I'm going to create a robot that can fold my laundry and put it away. So this task is actually uh, very difficult because if you think about it and you break down the kind of steps that are needed to um, perform this task, for one, you have to have uh, some sort of camera to look at your uh, laundry in front of you. You'd have to be able to separate each piece of clothes from the rest of the clothes. And then even if you were to be able to um, locate each piece of clothes, now you have to plan a path for your arm to come down grasp it and then fold it. So you can see this is a very involved task. So I think for simple tasks like sweeping up the floor, um, that's already here, you know, but for more difficult tasks, like a general person who would help you out around the house, that's probably like a few decades away once again. Great. Interesting, thank you. And I do see we have a couple questions in the chat uh, that pertain to robotics. So first up, uh, one of our attendees that says, there's a lot of AI in Star Wars. Do you have any predictions on the production of a singularity? Uh, so first, tell us what that means and, and what your thoughts on it are. Yeah, so uh, from my understanding, an AI singularity is where we get to the point sometime in the future where AI becomes so advanced that uh, it surpasses like the collective human intelligence. So this would be a scenario like in the Terminator series, you know, where you have Skynet that basically, uh, you know, rises up against humans and tries to take control of the world. Um, and I believe we're still very far away from that. Um, uh, as an example, like an anecdote, there's a uh, funny picture around on the internet where uh, people are discussing, you know, the uh, advancement of AI and how it could maybe turn into something like Skynet from the Terminator series. And um, the picture that's like a counterexample to Skynet is a AI that's trying to label a cat and a dog and it labels a cat as a dog, you know? So I think we're still pretty far away from uh, an AI that's able to, you know, do everything better than a human can just because of the fact that humans can do so many different tasks so well. So yeah, I think it'd be very difficult for like a general AI to come into play and be able to replace humans in every way possible. I suppose that's comforting in a way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So another question uh, from Peter, uh, who asks, in your experience, would something like C-3PO walk as awkwardly as he does, or would a model like him advanced enough to be advanced enough to have figured out a perfect gait by the time they figure out how to get him to speak? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that C-3PO is uh, walking very awkwardly just for comedic effect. Um, I think we have robots that are actually more agile than C-3PO, if you can imagine that. Um, once again, on the left-hand side, I'm gonna go uh, look at this example of Boston Dynamics Atlas robot. So there's actually a video that I, I unfortunately don't have on the slides here today, but you'll have a video of uh, this robot that can hop over a meter high. And then at the end of this video, he does a backflip onto the ground. Uh, that's like a meter underneath him. So um, I think that we actually have robots that can walk more fluidly and more gracefully than C-3PO can, even today. Very fascinating, thank you. And another yeah. question here uh, comes to you from Ruben, who asks, what are the things limiting humanoid robots from being fully human? Uh, and that relates to another topic uh, that I wanna to touch on is that there seem to be a lot of emotions held by these robots in Star Wars. Uh, okay. How realistic is that? And, and how does that compare to uh, today's technology? Yeah, definitely. Um, so to address both parts of that question, um, I can start with the emotion side. Um, so today we actually have algorithms out there that, you know, given a video of someone like a video of myself uh, and then also the audio from the video, it's actually able to identify what kind of emotions 
are um, the person that the person's feeling. So maybe you know, identify that I'm happy, sad, angry, for example. Um, but the other way around is not so common, I think. We have had robots in the past that are like animatronics that you might see at a theme park. So you might have like a robot that's trying to imitate like a previous president, for example. Um, and that requires the robot to like display emotions like anger and, or uh, happiness and such. Um, but in terms of robots that actually can understand like uh, thoughts and like have like a some approximation of uh, emotions, I'm not so sure that we're very close in that area. I think we're still uh, a ways off from that. Um, and some other things that are limiting humanoid robots from, you know, becoming just uh, as like as human as possible, you know, are just really basic things. Like um, I mentioned that we do have robots that can walk more uh, gracefully than C-3PO, but like walking around like a, a cluttered house, you know, or like going outside and walking on uneven terrain is still like a very difficult task for robots. So very basic things, um, are still a challenge for robots. There's actually a you know humorous video from a previous uh, robotics challenge in 2013, where uh, the task was given the robots to um, try to rescue a human from a building. So one of the tasks in this uh, video was actually you have to open a door. And I remember one of the uh, robots you know reached for the handle of the door, turned it a little bit, and then the entire robot just fell to the side and then couldn't get back up. So like simple tasks like these uh, that humans, most humans can do like without an issue uh, are still present a big uh, challenge for robots. Fascinating, thank you. And one other question I have for you before we open up the floor to all the panelists. Uh, so I attempted to count and it sounds like there's about 20 arms, legs or hands chopped up during the course of the Star Wars films which is quite a bit. Uh, and it leads to a prominence of prosthetic robotic limbs within the series. So my question for you is how realistic is this prosthetic limb technology compared to what's available for people today? Yeah, definitely. I'm gonna share my screen once again because I have a slide for that. Uh, one second. Um, so on this slide, I have two examples of robotic arms. Um, the one on the left, is actually a robotic arm that a, a child is wearing. And it's actually got patterns on it like BB-8 from the new Star Wars movies. Um, and then on the right hand side, I have a example of a robotic arm that was developed by a DARPA contract. And in this case, an older gentleman is wearing it and he's giving the thumbs up to the audience in the room. So um, in terms of our technology and how close it is to what we see in the Star Wars universe, I think we're quite close in this regard. Um, one method of controlling these robotic arms that you have for prosthetics is actually like looking at the muscles that contract within a person's uh, person's arm. So whereas a person might, you know, tense their arm or like raise a finger, for example, um, you can still connect these uh, sensors to those to the ends of those muscles and control robotic arm that way. So this might be one of the uh, ways that Luke could have controlled his robotic arm that he got in episode five. Um, some of the ways that we're still a ways off from the technology that we see in Star Wars is that you can see that these robotic arms in the picture um, are not very close at all to looking like real human arms. And I believe that uh, when Luke got his arm chopped off in episode five, he replaced it with a very lifelike arm. And I don't think we're very close in that regard. Um, so if you're wearing a prosthetic arm, it's definitely visible. People will know it's a prosthetic arm. Um, right. But other than that, I think we're very close in terms of its dexterity uh, and the uh, power that we have in the robotic arm. Fascinating. Thank you so much. We're going to open up to questions for all our panelists now. Uh, and I'm going to read from the Q&A here. Uh, so we have one for Barbara. Uh, from David, who wants to talk more about that faster than light speed travel and various options. And so he's talking about, given the idea of warping space rather than time, what about the theory of wormholes as shortcuts when it comes to space travel? So could you speak to that idea? Yes, I can. And although I don't have any interesting looking robots to show you, I can give you a cartoon version of wormholes. This is a, a lecture I gave in a introductory course on general relativity. A wormhole is just, as you see, a structure that 
connects the two widely separated points in space-time. So before I was talking about taking a ribbon and folding it, but if you could somehow stitch those two ends of the ribbon together, you would have a permanent wormhole, it's called, or bridge between the two ends of the ribbons. So you can think of it as taking two black holes where time is and space are highly curved and somehow, we don't know how, stitching them together. Mm. So wormholes are theoretically possible in that they're a mathematically valid solution of all of Einstein's equations. And the name wormhole actually goes back to the 1950s. So long before the Star Wars movies started, but John Wheeler, famous physicist who popularized the phrase black hole, decided to use the word wormhole because as the quote here says, uh, topologists would call it a multiply connected space, blah, blah, blah. Hey, let's call it a wormhole instead. So a wormhole can provide a shortcut through space. And in the movie Contact, for instance, perhaps to be discussed at a future panel, there's a wormhole that stretches from near Earth to near the star Vega. And if you take the usual routes trudging through ordinary space, it's 25 years for light to travel from Vega to the Earth or vice versa. However, the distance would be much smaller if you could travel through a wormhole. So, Theoretically, wormholes are permitted to exist. Unfortunately, uh, it was computed later on that they are highly unstable. They tend to pinch themselves off. So even if you could construct one, keeping it open long enough to pass through would be very difficult. Also, there's the unfortunate fact that the wormhole is not guaranteed to be shorter than the distance the long way around. So you could unfortunately end up with a wormhole that was a long cut rather than a short cut. <laughs> Fascinating, thank you so much. Our next question here is another theoretical question and this one goes to Dr. Chowdhury uh, from Andy who wants to know, is it theoretically possible to build a laser tractor beam? Oh, uh, wow, that's a very interesting question because uh, Lasers are certainly used to uh, trap uh, uh, small particles, right? Uh, even as big as like, uh, you know, uh, nanoparticles size. So they're like, you know, uh, maybe on the order of uh, hundreds or thousands of atoms together. But um, to, to actually get, uh, get a laser, basically what, what you do is that you, uh, you have to focus the laser in a certain way, and uh, that can create uh, basically uh, uh, enough so-called potential so that the, uh, the particle can't go outside of this. But to now bring it closer and closer, hmm, that's, going to be, uh, that's going to be tricky. And then you may have to also uh, charge up this particle, whatever it is, like a spaceship or something, because, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, but, but theoretically speaking, so far, we have not been able to uh, uh, trap anything much bigger than, you know, uh, you know, on the order of uh, uh, hundreds of atoms or uh, thousands of atoms. But I, I'm saying, like, you can trap a lot of atoms, but they're not, like, together in a clump. Uh, you cannot uh, trap like a, uh, I'm saying like a, a few gram size particle in a laser beam right now. Uh, you can trap, uh, you know, uh, smaller particles in, in, in various ways. So, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I don't think, uh, well, I can, I can be pretty confident that we don't have this technology yet. Right. And uh, if, if we have lasers powerful enough to do that, probably uh, we will reach the destroying part before tractoring it. I think the, the, the tractor beam uh, is, is, is going to be quite challenging. Uh, there, there are ways to manipulate, uh, as, as I said, right now to trap particles, but they're much, much smaller than uh, you know, any, anything that, that we normally handle in regular daily life. 
We're not traveling spaceships quite yet with those lasers. No, not yet. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, right. I do have the video of the laser if, if somebody is interested or people oh, are perfect. interested. Could you send that to me in the chat and I'll, I'll post it in the chat for everybody to see? Oh, uh, oh sorry. Uh, it's in a PowerPoint, so I have to oh, no compress problem. it and, and send it to you and then maybe you can send it back. Perfect. That's uh, great. I'll send it to folks uh, after, after today's event as well as the recording of today's, in case you, anyone missed part of it, we are recording today's webinar. Um, so next question uh, is for David from Diana, who says, I'm annoyed that in Star Wars, they always have the sounds of the spacecraft. Can you talk about sound in outer space? So, so sound, of course, needs a medium to travel through because you need something to essentially, you need some, some atoms and molecules to vibrate. So if someone screams at me over there, there's causing some vibration of the air molecules in between them and me, and I hear it. Obviously in space, it's essentially a vacuum and there's nothing there to do that. And so you wouldn't hear anything, but I would, I would ask, answer this question with another question. Imagine watching Star Wars with no sound on. Um, one little way you could explain it though, is if you were inside a spaceship and the spaceship were, you know, creating blasters and being shot at and stuff you would hear that within the spaceship because you're within the spaceship you have air and an atmosphere and stuff and so you definitely hear noise those sort of secondhand noises but if you were outside the spaceship you wouldn't hear it. but of course i mean they also fly around like airplanes and there's no space uh, there's no air sorry so there's no reason why they should fly around like airplanes either but it just looks bloody cool that's the explanation <laughs> That's very, very true. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to throw one other question here to Andrew from Stefan, who says, a long time ago in the same galaxy, though, I had given up on winning the chess game against the computer. But do I now need to be scared that I cannot, that now I cannot even win a simple game of Go? That is to ask, has AI overtaken us humans in being able to analyze complex situations such that we will be re relegated to the sidelines, i.e. maybe we can't even be able to understand the question. <laughs> so I think the key part of that is, has AI overtaken humans when it comes to analyzing complex situations, which is something that is shown within the Star Wars universe? Yeah, um, I think, once again, this is a really good question, and it depends on the application that we're looking at AI within. Um, so like you pointed out in the game of Go and also in chess, um, there are AIs that can outperform, uh, I think, all humans in those games. But if we look at like other daily tasks like driving around on the road, um, I believe that humans will still like be up neck and neck you know, to any like cutting-edge AI uh, autonomous car solution that we have right now. And... Um, Right, so I think it really depends on the application that we're looking at, whether we're looking at like games, video games, or like day-to-day um, -day tasks. Right, and I thought it was interesting when you mentioned that day-to-day -day task of simply folding laundry being so much more difficult for a robot to, to understand than us humans. I think that's a really good example. Right, exactly. So unfortunately, we are almost at the end of our hour here. Uh, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time, although I'd, I'd love to just keep going because we have a lot of great questions still. However, the good news is you can join us next month for the next installment of our monthly movie night series, uh, which will be all about Star Trek. And I know there's going to be some similar technologies and also some differences. So if you're also a Star Trek fan, you are in luck because you can join us next month on October 28th, which is also Wednesday at 8 p.m. And I'll drop the link for registering in the chat here. Um, so be sure to save that and sign up to join us uh, and hopefully we can answer more of your questions then. Uh, I also want to share that, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is part of the WestFest series, uh, which has online events happening this week through Saturday, October 3rd, all in different fields of STEM, engineering, and science in general. Uh, and so if you're interested in learning more about those events being hosted by Ohio State's various science departments, you can go to go.osu.edu slash WestFest, which I also just dropped in the chat. So with that, I want to thank all of our fantastic panelists. I feel like I learned a lot and now I just want to go watch a bunch of movies. Uh, and so I want to thank you all so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. I had a lot of fun and I hope to see you all next month. Thank you very much.
Take care. Have a good night. Take care. Thank you. Ha, <laughs> ha,